So uh, let us say, let us start. And I would say good afternoon to the participants in Japan and good morning to our guest speaker in Israel. I am Ada Tagar Cohen, the director of the Center for the Interdisciplinary Study of the Monotheistic Religions, uh, abbreviated as CISMOR at Tosha University in Kyoto. Uh, thank you for joining CISMOR seminar today on the Zoom platform. Uh, we will be recording the seminar today and we'll later place the video on Sysmore homepage. So if you don't want to, um, to be seen, uh, that's fine. Just leave your video off. Um, we will have um, an about one hour lecture by Professor Meital, and then we will have some time uh, about 30 minutes to uh, ask questions and have answers and uh, <clears throat> and then uh, we, we will be over. So uh, let me say that I'm pleased to host today uh, at our seminar, Professor uh, Yoram Meital from Ben Gurion University of the Negev in Israel. Professor Meital is a professor of Middle Eastern studies and his research focuses on the political, social, cultural, and economic developments in Middle Eastern societies. And his interests extend to international politics, peace and conflict studies, diplomacy, and more. Uh, Professor Meital earned his degrees, the bachelor degree, MA degree, and the a PhD from the University of Haifa in Israel. And since 1994, has been a member of the Department of Middle East Studies at Ben Gurion University of the Negev. During his career, he has been a guest professor in several universities in the world. The latest in 2019, he was distinguished fellow at the Herbert Katz Center for Advanced Judaic Studies at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, professor Meital has published so far seven books and edited four books with numerous articles in journals and book chapters. His recent book that was published in 2017 by Oxford University Press titles, Revolutionary Justice, Special Courts and the Formation of Republican Egypt. As Professor Meital has dedicated part of his research to Egypt, today he will offer us a short view of the sacred places for the Jewish community in Cairo. The title of his talk is An Old Bible Rediscovered in Cairo and the Future of Egyptian Jewish Heritage. Mm -hmm. Professor Meital, with much honor, the Zoom is yours. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Good morning. Uh, good morning from here. Uh, good afternoon for you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Adatigar Cohen, for uh, the first of all for the invitation uh, to uh, to present this uh, work study and to share with you my thoughts about um, about uh, how I get into. Uh, uh, this uh, rare manuscript and uh, how I worked on it. And um, uh, also uh, I'm uh, delighted with this very nice introduction. Uh, so thank you so much. Uh, it is a pleasure uh, uh, to present uh, this study uh, in this um, uh, context and thanks to the Zoom meeting uh, mechanism, we can do it from afar, uh, fortunately. Uh, I, will, um, I will just now try to upload my uh, presentation. So if you can make me a co-host. You are. 
and please let me know if you see the you see the presentation perfect okay so for 2000 years at least at least egypt was home to a prosperous jewish community today only a few jewish still live in egypt a remnant of a glorious uh, and ancient community that totaled some 80 thousands in 1947, comprised uh, of three Jewish congregations, Sephardic, Ashkenazi, and Karai Jews. In addition uh, to ancient cemeteries and valuable Judaica items, 13 synagogues still stand in uh, the Egyptian capital. Most of them are of historical, cultural, and architectural uh, architectural uh, value. Uh, ben Ezra Synagogue most likely is the most famous among among this synagogue, as uh, uh, because of the Cairo Geniza, which was kept there for over a thousand years. Uh, another very famous uh, synagogue, or not famous to all, but uh, I hope famous now is the uh, Moshe Musa Dere uh, Karait uh, Synagogue, uh, um, which we focus on in this uh, 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 lecture. Uh, this was uh, uh, the center uh, or the new center of the Karait um, uh, community in Cairo for um, several decades. And uh, under a certain circumstances, this ancient community used to, uh, to safeguard and to keep a very rare manuscript, manuscripts of the Hebrew Bible uh, in their possession. Um, in some point in time, they transferred uh, most of their collection into the uh, Musa Deri uh, uh, Musa Deri uh, Synagogue. Uh, one of the most renowned, uh, well-known um, uh, item in um, uh, the uh, Codex Cairenes uh, of the Hebrew Bible copied by Moshe ben Asher and according to its colophon, you know, the first page of an um, old manuscript called the colophon. Uh, according to its colophon, it was written in the year 895. So this is one of the very, very first copy of the uh, Hebrew Bible. Uh, uh, after this codex, this codex was taken out of Egypt and now most likely it is in uh, Jerusalem. No one will let you know for sure, but most likely, after this codex was taken out of Egypt, the Zachariah ben Anan manuscript, the manuscript that we deal today with, uh, um, has become the community's most valuable manuscript. Now, this manuscript, Zachariah ben Anan manuscript, is the whole books of the third part of the Jewish Bible, which is called Ketuvim or writings. Okay, and this lecture focuses on the rediscovery of the Ben Anan manuscript and the current efforts to preserve Jewish heritage in Egypt. I contend today that the rediscovery of Ben Anan manuscript provides an opportunity to examine the broad and profound meanings of preservation of Jewish heritage in countries in which the Jewish community ceased to exist. In other words, it allows us to discuss what might be called, or I used to call it, the future of the Jewish past in Egypt. 
Now, uh, let me start by pointing out that I came across the rare Karite corpus, the whole of the collection of manuscripts, including Benanan manuscript. I, I came across this rare corpus by sheer coincidence. In late July, 2017, four years ago, I was invited to Cairo to participate in a, a project initiated by Magda Harun, president of the local Jewish community, and who is, I, I hope so, joining us today in this lecture. A grant from the American Research Center in Egypt provided us with the means to conduct a comprehensive survey of 11 synagogues in Cairo, including their historical and architectural documentation. We focused on assessing the condition of the synagogues, the structures, the buildings, and documenting them in writing and pictures. We took hundreds of videos and uh, hours of video and hundreds of uh, 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 photos uh, during this uh, project. The Moshe uh, Der is synagogue, uh, which you, ho I hope you can see here. Do you see that I switched the uh, presentation? Yes, that's the fine. Moshe? Okay, the Moshe Der is synagogue, which you can see on the right side of the screen, uh, is situated in a monumental building. You can you can you can see this, right? Uh, it, it is built in style typical to the newer houses of worship erected in Cairo at the beginning of the 20th century. It is indeed a majestic building that mirrors self-confidence, the self-confidence of its founders who felt entirely secure amidst Egypt's Muslim majority. The, the, the project or the team that I was part of uh, arrived at uh, this synagogue on Thursday, July 27, 2017. Here you can see, you can see the team. Uh, this visit uh, took place on a very hot summer day uh, and, and the first two hours uh, we are dedicated to the documentation of the synagogue uh, structure. Later, we moved on to the smaller library hall uh, uh, located, located um, in the uh, southern courtyard of the temple compound. And you can see now part of this um, on your screen, part of this library. The shelves that you can see here were loaded with dusty volumes, but in the corner, a wooden drawer contained hundreds of library cards. You know, these old, uh, old cards that we used to uh, in, in libraries uh, before the uh, electronic uh, catalog came into our life. One of the catalog cards of this old card was dedicated to a book in Arabic uh, named Al Yahudiya, the Jewesses, a story written in Arabic by Murad Farag, uh, most likely the, the most prominent, uh, I would say the most prominent Egyptian Karait uh, of the first of the uh, 20th century, first half of the 20th century. While trying to locate the book, I reached lower shell over here, a lower uh, um, uh, uh, shell um, contain several packages wrapped in a white paper as the one you can see on the right side of the screen. On the back cover of the first wrapping, somebody had written in Hebrew, you can see it on the screen now, Gotail 22. You see the Hebrew letters, Gotail 22. I was 
utterly overwhelmed when upon unwrapping the dusty cover, hundreds of parchments unraveled before my very eyes. A quick glance left no room for doubt. It was a biblical manuscript. I carefully drew Magda's attention to the matter and offered to examine the finding later on. In the evening, I wrote in my journal. I used to, to wrote a, a, a journal almost every day during my um, you know, studying tour to Egypt or other places. And this is what I wrote in briefly in my journal that late evening, quote, there are hundreds of pages made of parchment containing biblical text in the Karait library. There seem to be an ancient manuscript that requires preservation. On the dusty shelves of the modest library, there are real treasures, end of quote. By the way, I did not locate Morat Farag's book that I looked for that day. Furthermore, the tight schedule did not allow uh, for my return to the library of the Karait synagogue at that time. In fact, during that visit to Cairo, if I read my, uh, my journal, my writing, uh, uh, I think that I did not attribute uh, the proper importance to the rediscovery of the corpus of manuscript whose significance and value are immeasurable. As a historian of modern Egypt, dealing with ancient manuscript was terra incognita, an unfamiliar land uh, uh, to me, and it required me it required uh, 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 a lot of time to study uh, the the, this subject from, from scratch. Now, upon my return to Israel, back at my office in Ben-Gurion University, I re-examined my notes and photographs from the visit to Cairo. I focused on the few sentences I written down in my journal and several photos of the first pages of the manuscript in the package entitled Gotail 22. Several months later, I was back in uh, Moshe Deri synagogue and the library hall. Um, um, uh, and then a true treasure has been waiting there for decades. Then I discovered it really. Over the books and under heaps of uh, dusty papers, uh, I began to unravel one wrapping after the, the other. I wrote in my journal again, quote, my head is blowing away, is blown away, end of quote, by, by the thought of the treasure that has been unraveled before, uh, uh, before me. Manuscripts that were written hundreds of years ago, some of them might be over a thousand years old. Now, over dinner with my partners in Cairo, a discussion had started that developed over the following months uh, about how this hidden treasure we uncovered should be treated. From the very start, uh, uh, Magda took the lead, uh, the lead and, and she insisted that uh, we embrace the, the assumption that everything that we will find must be kept as the community assets in Egypt and should be publicized only later on, one at a time, only after a thorough examination. Now, allow me, I, I gave you the general context, allow me to elaborate about, um, about the, um, uh, ben Anan uh, biblical uh, manuscript about the the very features of this uh, of this manuscript. Several accurate details have been preserved Ben Anan manuscript uh, 
uh, apart from other copies of the Hebrew Bible written up to the beginning of the 11th uh, century. Ben Anan manuscript is dated accurately and includes the full name of the scribe who had copied the biblical text, vocalized it, and wrote the Masorah. You know, Masorah to all of us uh, who are not aware of this is a, a kind of a list of commentaries on the text of the Bible. And the purpose of the Masora uh, was to create a, a uniform text in all the communities, uh, in all of the Jewish communities and preserving, and sorry, and preventing uh, uh, future changes uh, or, or mistakes. Now, the, the Ben Anan manuscript also include a reference to the place it was copied. And it also provides information about the persons who commissioned this biblical text as the, the scribe to write this biblical text. In addition, in most part, the parchments are in excellent, beautiful condition a few dozens uh, uh, of parchments were damaged by moisture and the ink uh, slightly faded. In some places, the parchment have been damaged uh, irreversibly uh, and the writing uh, and the written text uh, uh, was lost. But if I look into the whole of this manuscript over 600 parchments, so the vast majority is, uh, as I said, uh, the vast majority of the parchments are in excellent, uh, excellent uh, uh, condition. In fact, it is uh, hard to stay indifferent uh, uh, facing, I, I will try to show you now one of these. Look at this. It is hard to stay in different facing uh, the beauty of this manuscript, which indicates the immense effort required from the artisans involved in its production. Especially impressive are the fine square letters, uh, Hebrew letters of the, the biblical uh, text. You see it here in the middle. And the Masora. The Masora is this beautiful illustrations on the side, on the bottom, and up of the main or the central uh, text. Look into the, the, this illustration, the ornamentation and uh, the vocalization here. They are all very beautiful. Ben Anan manuscript contains 500. 69 parchment containing all the books and scrolls included in Ketuvim, as I said, the third part of the Hebrew Bible. Uh, all these uh, books of Ketuvim and in addition, 12 pages with the details of the scribe, its owner, and clarifications of the Masora and the vowels. And this is very, very rare to find. Again, recall that we are dealing here with a text that was written in the year 1028, the beginning of the 11th century. The order of the books in this manuscript is different than the accepted order in the Hebrew Bible of later date, the, the Bible that we use now. For instance, the book of Ezra appears without the customary separation of the 10 chapters of the book of Ezra and the 13 chapters of the book of Nehemiah, as seen in ancient manuscript. The 27 chapters of the Hayamim 
Chronicles 1 and 36 chapters of Divrei Ayamim 2 are presented in Ben Anan manuscript as one book, not two books, not two Divrei Ayamim, but just one. A more significant expression of this different editing can be found in the location of the book of Divrei Ayamim. The biblical narrative on the lineage of humanity from Adam, Adam, uh, to Koresh, Cyrus, declaration appears as the first book of Ketuvim and not as the last chapter of the entire Bible as is customary in the Hebrew Bible today. So you see the difference between uh, this text of old Hebrew Bible and the standard Bible that we use today. Again, or moreover, unlike the partition to verses and chapters used in the Hebrew Bible, in the Ben Anan manuscript, uh, there is no such division. In general, the biblical text is presented uninterrupted and with no indication between chapters. Occasionally, there is a double spaced row, as you can see here, a double spaced row between paragraphs that will later be organized as chapters. In terms of, um, in terms of uh, uh, form, the form, uh, the Ben Anan manuscript is quite similar to other ancient manuscripts, among them the famous Ben Asher Codex and the Leningrad Codex. You can see them here. So you see the Aleppo Codex, a very famous Aleppo Codex. You see here the Leningrad Codex, and you see the Ben Anan Codex. You can see that in terms of the form, they are quite similar. Uh, the method uh, uh, of vocalizing, the style of the Masora, you see the Masora here and the Masora here, you see the Masora again here, and the various markings all attest to these uh, similarities. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, the text uh, in the Ben Anan manuscript is written on a, a quite large parchment, very much like the Aleppo and the Leningrad Codex. Uh, the measures are 36.4 centimeters on 34.6 centimeters. So it's, it's quite a large folio. Both sides of the letter are similarly processed and well buffed. The text and Masora are written in a style that we call, or professionally, we call it Orient style. You can see these square letters here. The ink color in the biblical text is reddish brown, and in the Masora, it is blackish. So you have different colors in this text, and we can notice, try to imagine this. It was written in the 11th century. We still can notice these colors very beautifully uh, handwritten down. The major part of the biblical text is divided into three columns, and uh, uh, most part or the major part um, uh, is divided uh, uh, by 18 rows, see, you see it over here. Like, uh, like other, um, uh, let me change the, yeah, go back here. Like other early manuscript, Ben Anan manuscript includes many illustrations which correspond with the impressive tradition of Arabic calligraphy of the time especially outstanding illustrations were combined at the beginning of the book and its end as, for example, 
the famous verses at the opening of the book of Psalm and its ending. You see it here. Ashrei Aish Asher Lo Alach Asher Lo Alach Be'atzat Reshaim Uvederech Hataim Ve'moshav Leitzim Lo Yashav and etc. 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 Other prominent characteristic of the of the of this Ben Anan manuscript are the are are the corrections and additions to the biblical text after its completion. Now this is typical to to medieval rare text that you you find here and there corrections. The the longest one, you can see it here. The longest correction in the entire manuscript was made to Esther, Megillat Esther, to Esther chapter nine, verse 13, where there are no less than seven corrected rows. You can maybe notice them over, over here. It start on the upper right column and it say la yudim asher meshushan laasot kadat hayom etc. etc. Uh, quote to the Jews uh, which are in Shushan and it continues. Now this part written in a smaller letter, I hope you, you can notice if you compare to the standard uh, letters here with the correction, you see that uh, uh, the correction uh, was written in, a, in smaller letters than the standard font. Uh, in the old manuscript. And uh, um, in addition uh, uh, to the correction, something very rare to find is that this 1000 years almost uh, old uh, manuscript uh, uh, includes also the colophon, the cover. In fact, the first page of uh, the rare manuscript. The colophon on the cover of Benana manuscript has only partially survived. You can see it here. It's only partially survived. See that there are missing parts over here. But the legible part enabled the identification of the owner's genealogy, the, uh, the, the writing style, language, and terminology of the three dedication, we have three dedication here, one, two, three, three dedications that are uh, identifiable, uh, show that they were written by different people. The, the, the letters over here are completely different from those uh, in the bottom on the and on the left uh, side. Um, so definitely uh, we are talking about three different dedications uh, that uh, were written by different people and at different periods of time. At the top of the flyleaf, there is a valuable data and this is very important. This is the first, the first dedication written in Hebrew letters about the first owner and the name is over here. I hope you can see it here. Uh, uh, it says Ovadia HaKohen Ben Moshe HaKohen. Alongside the collection of letters that were quite customary in dedication on ancient Hebrew manuscript. And it said the, uh, the one who uh, purchased this book is uh, His Highness and then uh, the name and uh, the title of this uh, very respectful individual. On the main part uh, and at the bottom uh, portion of this colophon are 15 lines in Hebrew. Their ink now faded, the, uh, but I think that one day with you know, uh, the super uh, tools, technological tools we have today, uh, I, I, I guess we will be able one uh, day uh, to, uh, to, to encode this uh, part that the ink uh, now faded and it cannot be read, uh, um, uh, except for 
a, a, a few lines, uh, which says, um, uh, uh, again, some details about the next uh, uh, honor. Um, now, on the left side of the page over here, this is very interesting because the, uh, 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 the text is written in Judeo-Arabic. So it's uh, Hebrew letters, <coughs> Hebrew letters, but it's, uh, 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 it, is, it is Arabic. And it said um, in uh, my free translation, transferred upon a valid legitimate purchase from the ownership of Mr. And then we don't have the name. And, but in, in, in Arabic, it said, in takala bi hukum al bi' al sahih al shar'i min mulk al sayyid. And then the text is, uh, uh, cannot be read. But again, one day I think we will be able with technology uh, to read it, to read the rest of this uh, uh, illegible uh, text. Now, let me move uh, to the, uh, uh, sorry, to the end, uh, the last page of the manuscript, uh, which consists uh, of two columns, this and this one, these two columns containing the last verses of Ezra and Nehemiah. As I said, this is one book in this manuscript. The third column needs our very close attention. The third column contains valuable information. Uh, anytime that I read this, I, I'm, I'm just holding my head. Written in the first person by the scribe who copied, and, uh, who copied the manuscript and vocalized it. There is also an indication of a name and the completion date um, uh, of the manuscript. See this here. I don't know if you can read it. I will read it for you. I like to read it. <laughs> I, Zechariah, the scribe Ben Anan, the teacher from the land in the West, rest in the garden of Eden, I wrote and vocalized with the help of God this Ketuvim Chronicles. For the distinguished Itzhak Hapera Hatov, Itzhak, son of Ephraim HaKohen, successfully completed, it said in kind of Aramic, Safatava, successfully completed in the year 4000. And 788 to the creation. What a beautiful statement. See from here, I, Zakaria, Asofer, Baranan, Amelamed Meeretz Maharab, Noch Began Eden, Katafti Venikadeti, Bezrat, and continue the text, and you give, you see uh, the date. Beshnat Arbat Alafim, Usheva Meot, Ushemonim, Ushmona. The creation. What a beautiful. This means that Ben Anan manuscript was completed in the year 10, 1028, according to the Gregorian calendar. Following this, embedded in the illustrated calligraphy that will be uh, described. The scribe named the precise date, not only the year, but the precise date on which he had finished his work. And he said it here, very difficult for you to read, but this is the next page, the last page of the book. And the, uh, the, the date is the eighth day in the month of Tammuz, end of quote. So, you can also uh, see in this page, in this page, uh, the beautiful illustration in, sh in the shape of an arch over here. Everything here is text in Hebrew, everything. These are the most important. These are the details about, about the scribe 
and about the uh, dates that I just mentioned. Uh, in the middle, uh, it consists uh, biblical verses, uh, 16 straight rows at its center, 16 here, uh, written in non-vocalized letters, providing additional details uh, on the manuscript, its scribe and its owner. Above it, on both sides, as I just mentioned, of the main, uh, on, on this both sides, two columns are added. At the top of the right column over here, I, I, I translate to you from the Hebrew, it said, I have written to remove all sin and to follow a pure road in the spirit of God and soul, end of quote. At the top of the left column over here, it said the following again, mind blowing. Quote, finished with the help of God, the months of Tammuz on the eighth day with blessing, amen, end quote. In the first row of the arch illustration described Zachariah reveals that he belongs to the Tiberian tradition of copiers of the Hebrew Bible and the Masora. Now this is very important to people who studying uh, this old uh, tradition of the Tiberian uh, uh, tradition and the Masora, um, we do not have the time to go um, uh, into, uh, into this uh, now. So I would uh, like to take the rest of the um, time left uh, and to, to talk about maybe the future of, of this manuscript and in general, uh, all the corpus that uh, uh, we've been able um, uh, to rediscover uh, in Cairo. The future of the Benanan manuscript uh, and the rest of these books, I suggest should be discussed in both historical and current day context. The comparison to the Cairo Geniza, the very famous Cairo Geniza, is imperative and relevant. There is no doubt that the Cairo Geniza led to the rewriting of the history of Jewish and non-Jewish societies in the immense land between India uh, in the east to Morocco in the west. Still, it is essential to note that this Geniza collection uh, uh, was uh, safeguarded for hundreds of years in synagogues and cemeteries uh, in Cairo, and they were removed from the possession, legitimate possession of their owners, the local Jewish community, irreversibly and in very questionable circumstances. Similar, exactly, exactly similar to the removal of countless archeological items throughout the Middle East and Africa and Asia. The emptying of the Geniza in Cairo was carried out and in a way enabled under the patronage patronage uh, of colonial rule, in this case, the British colonial rule in Egypt in the 19th uh, century. The rediscovery of the Karait corpus, including Benanan manuscript, uh, offers a significant opportunity to shed light on the general project of restoring and bringing Jewish cultural heritage back to fruition. The discussion over the fate of Benanan manuscript and the rest of the rare Karite corpus requires seriously considering the significant positive attitudinal shift within Egyptian regime toward the heritage of the Jewish community. President Abdel Fattah Sisi, the current president, mentioned protecting the cultural heritage of minorities 
including the Jewish minority, on at least three occasions, which in my opinion is very bold and unprecedented move. This shift echoes a revisionist trend in public and cultural discourse that has developed in Egypt in recent years, according to which the Jewish community is seen as a, a, an inherent uh, part of Egyptian society and its history. The opinions and arguments that arise in this context are inseparable from the ongoing debates about the history of modern Egypt and its evolving cultural identity as a result of the country's diminishing minority groups. Of course, not everyone, and this is important to say here, not everyone support the project of preservation of Jewish heritage in Egypt. The critiques, and this is also very important to my opinion, the critiques are often coming from Egyptians who oppose the preservation of Jewish heritage as part of their struggle or political struggle against the policy led by the regime, President Abdel Fattah Sisi especially. <clears throat> In this context, an unprecedented project of preservation of Jewish heritage is taking place led by Magda Harun and involv involving many non-Jewish Egyptians and in part sponsored by the Egyptian government. I have been fortunate enough to participate in not few uh, projects that, that, that this include, um, that include in, 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 in this uh, uh, preservation of Jewish heritage. There is already a much appreciated effort to establish Jewish heritage library in Cairo. The library will be the new home for thousands of books already collected from several synagogues. The Karait corpus of manuscript and rare books, including Benanan manuscript, will be the crowning glory of the entire collection. The library will be open to all Egyptians and foreigners wishing to learn about the spiritual and intellectual heritage of Jews in the land of the uh, pyramids. The library website uh, will display high resolution scans of the manuscripts and the other documents. This blessed initiative allows us to think of an alternative for, the, for emptying the Geniza and removing its content from Egypt. It would also allow us to better understand the link between past and present as both sides of the very same coin. I would stop here and leave the floor open to comments and questions. Thank you very much for fascinating talk. I, I'm really uh, very excited uh, about, the, about it. And it's, um, it's amazing how, how these material, I mean, the material, the, the, the leather uh, remained for such a long time. This is really a, a beautiful. Uh, I have many questions, but I think maybe first we'll let uh, participants to place their own thoughts and questions and so on. Let I see take, some. Just a pencil to take your notes. Okay. Uh, okay. I see some mm. friends already. Uh... <laughs> Hi, Mr. Cohen Dozo. Uh, thank you very much for the lecture. You were indeed extremely lucky uh, to have come upon this uh, uh, great discovery. Uh, and like Ada, I have many, many questions, but um, let me start with two. Uh, first of all, uh, you haven't explained um, 
about the um, uh, inscription outside the manuscript in Hebrew, Gotthail, uh, who and what, uh, or what was this Gotthail? Uh, I guess you must have found out. Um, and um, second, um, um, Karai, this is a, 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 a Karai um, um, synagogue and library. And um, traditionally, there was a lot of uh, animosity between um, um, Karaites and uh, Rabbinite uh, Jews. Of course, uh, nowadays it's not very important because not, not many Karaites left, and uh, 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 certainly not in Egypt. I don't know if there are any 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 left. But uh, no. I understand that the, the the intention is to bring them all together. Uh, Jews, uh, I mean, uh, Rabbinite, Karaite, um, and um, um, in, in the in the um, library that you envision, uh, uh, will there be any distinction between them, or uh, will they all be uh, presented together? Uh, and um, uh, well, maybe one one more question is. Uh, are there any um, experts in uh, biblical manuscript who uh, are going to or already have uh, examined uh, this uh, specific manuscript? Thank you. Uh, Professor Ada, you want me to respond or to- Yes, take yes, I think we will go one by uh, uh, question after question you can answer, please. Okay. Um, uh, Doron, thank you so much for, for the comment. I'm. Um, you know, I'm I'm still thrilled, and uh, with 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 all this, and anyone, any of us who deals with history, usually we 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 have uh, you know our resources in archives or uh, academic centers that someone already found them, but uh, in a very rare opportunities, we play the role of the archaeologists. You know, like finding the, 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 you know, this manuscript. And Doron, of course, you, you can share with me, Annie. I'm, uh, I, I'm a historian of modern era. And for me, uh, working on manuscript sounds like uh, turning to become like an astronaut. It's like, what is it? <laughs> Yanni, I was not even aware of where to start with Doron. Mm -hmm. uh, so I will go one by one on your points. Uh, so first of all, uh, Richard Gotthail, uh, you, you can see it on, on the screen now, right? Richard Gotthail uh, was a brilliant, brilliant uh, scholar uh, of um, a Semitic studies uh, uh, of the, just the, the time of Solomon Schechter and the Geniza the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century. He was worldwide known at that time. He was one of the, you know, the very famous name uh, of, of, the, of the time. He wrote Duron, you won't believe it, over 200 academic articles about Semitic and about Jewish uh, uh, studies in, in general. He, he was frequent, not only in Arabic, Hebrew, of course, and ancient Hebrew, uh, but also Persian and Turkish. He was brilliant. He was really some exceptional scholar at the time. Now, he visited the Karait community in the year 1904, just the beginning of the 20th century. And they, uh, he stayed with them. He really liked the Karait. You know, he has this empathy for this small uh, community, and he stayed for uh, uh, several days with them. The Karait the Chacham Rabbi uh, allowed him to study this rare manuscript, including the Rom, the Ben Asher Codex, that at the time was there. You see. So he was stoned by, by this. He get back to uh, the US and he wrote an article 
that you can, you can see now on the screen. This article was published by the Jewish Quarterly Review under the title, Some Hebrew Manuscripts in Cairo. It was published in the year 1905. Of course, you know that the Jewish Quarterly Review is the oldest uh, and very respectful uh, journal uh, in, in Jewish studies. And he chose this journal, obviously, to publish his findings. And something very interesting, of course, the technology would not allow him to have what I had, you know, scanning and, and taking copies. We're talking about just the early 20th century. So he used taking notes on his pencil. So this article in the Jew, uh, Jewish Quarterly Review is 46 pages long, Toron. In this article, he surveyed, he surveyed dozens, almost 60 manuscripts and books. So he could say very little about each of this. And he made a lot of mistake about the about Zachariah Ben Anan manuscript because he hasn't the time. But he is saying that this is the second after uh, the uh, Ben Asher Codex. This is the second in, in importance. And he was amazed by the beauty of, of this text. And of course, we now understand why, because he, he saw this uh, text that I shared with you uh, earlier. So this is Gotai. Uh, now, when I, something personal, Doron, when I, when I decided to publish an article, academic article about this uh, rediscovery, I did the same in the same journal. I decided to go to the same journal, the Jewish Quarterly Review, and I published this article that you can go online and find it. A thousand years old biblical manuscript rediscovered in Cairo, the future of the Egyptian Jewish past. You can see that it's very close to the title that I agreed upon with Ada uh, for today's uh, presentation. Um, and, and, and if you're interested in this, you can see that in, in this article, I, I try to update, not to say to correct, Professor Gotthild's findings, because there are so many mistakes. If he would not have the time. He didn't uh, say a word about, uh, uh, about the Masora. Uh, he didn't say a word about the illustration. He made some mistakes about quoting uh, the colophon, again, because he didn't ha uh, have the time to study it carefully. Just a few hours that he looked into it. As for the second, uh, that I'm going, moving to the second question about the relationships between Karait and Rabbinate, Rabbinate uh, Jews. Uh, of course, there is, you know, very intensive writing about this uh, uh, topic. Uh, one of my best reference to this is Maimonides itself. Maimonides itself, uh, who arrived in, in, in Cairo and, you know, wrote his, most his, of his brilliant writing uh, in Fustat, Cairo, uh, found there when he arrived um, a very large Karait community. At the beginning of his time in Cairo, these, his early writing on the Karait was kind of hostile. He was very suspicious. He disliked their approach, of course, to the Talmud. Obviously, Maimonides, you know, who with Mishnah Torah, Mishneh Torah, uh, uh, based everything we know about, about the, uh, this tradition of oral uh, Jewish law, um, for him, the Karait uh, presumption that the Talmud is, is kind of, uh, uh, how, to, how to put it, um, not important. Forgery. Uh, hmm? Forgery. A forgery, even worse, you see. So for him, it was a kind of a scene. It, it, it's something unbelievable for him. But, and this is very interesting. We have a lot of letters written by Maimonides in the Cairo Geniza. And there you can see a gradual shift. 
So he would say, no, we can both uh, wine from them. Uh, no, we can, uh, we can invite them to our uh, wedding ceremonies. And, but we, we, we will let them know we disagree on the principles. Okay, now move fast to the modern time. In the 20th century, the first half of the 20th century, relationship between uh, uh, Rabinet and Karait in Egypt has become uh, very closed and friendly. The community, there are two different communities. The regime acknowledged each of them as an autonomous community with its bylaws, so separate. And of course, they have their very different customs, praying, everything is so different. You know, for instance, those who are not aware of this, uh, when you, when a Karai uh, get to a synagogue, first thing, he do the purification of the body and he put off his shoes and get like in a mosque, he get into the synagogue itself. And in the synagogue, you find no chairs and no benches, just carpets. And they pray by bowing, very similar to the Muslim tradition. Did they copy the, the, the Islamic tradition? The, the answer is definitely no. They just based their uh, 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 interpretation only on the Bible itself. Okay? Uh, like the, the words that uh, God told Moses in the burning uh, snake. So for them, they keep with, with this tradition. They become very closed in the 20th century. Since the 1980s, the number of Karait, and I met the last one, I was accompanying them back in the 1980s. The last of them still live in Cairo. Uh, about uh, 10 years ago, the last Karait passed away. And no Karait in Cairo today, or in Egypt in general. And Magda Harun, whom I mentioned so many times in my lecture, she took responsibility for everything Jewish. Everything relates to Jewish heritage to her including uh, <laughs> this, of course, treasure of manuscripts. Now, in the library that we envision to your next question, uh, we will have all this documentation in one place. Ashkenazi documents, we have, would you believe it? We have documents in Yiddish produced in Cairo. We have this Karait and we have a lot, we have tons of, uh, rabbinic uh, text and books, all will be in the back. In the catalog, we will make it for the users to know what is this item, where we, where it was found, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I think thank I addressed you. the question. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I will go to the next question. Uh, Professor Metar, uh, thank you for showing us a beautiful manuscript of Bible. And uh, I would like to know uh, uh, the place uh, of uh, this manus manuscript in uh, Karai mind. Uh, what, what is the uh, meaning? Mm. Mm. Yeah, of the body. I understand. Yeah. Right, a beautiful question. Um, um, two brief uh, comments on this. One, the Karait um, used this old corpus, all the manuscript of the Bible, mainly for studying and teaching, studying and teaching, compare the prayer books they use to the old manuscripts. This is one. And second, they use them as a kind of uh, protection by God for the community. 
it's like amulets for them. They did not use them, uh, uh, Mr. Kutaro, they did not use them, for instance, as a geniza. They did not use to take them and bury them in a cemetery. For them, they are assets of the community to be protected by the community for good. So they are not going like in the rabbinic tradition when you have, um, uh, when you have a Bible that was torn apart, you know, like pages is missing. So this Bible cannot use for uh, reading the Torah. And in most cases, what the rabbinic Jewish community did is uh, taking it as a geniza. Of course, geniza was not to throw away the old Bible, but to take it uh, to a, a section in the Jewish cemetery and to bury it in a special custom in the deep in the land. And this tradition, of course, you're aware, is going on till our very day. But for the Karait, the old corpus, all the old corpus uh, was perceived as something special, not a Geniza. Mm -hmm. And they kept this manuscript from the 11th century for 1000 years. It was a treasure. In the synagogue that I found the you know, this uh, Ben Anan manuscript, they used to have a safe, a big safe, a metal heavy safe with two keys that two different individuals hold. <laughs> so anytime they want to open the safe, they have to have the two of them <laughs> in the same place, in the same time. And, and this was, for most of the 20th century. When the community was completely dismantling, it will not exist anymore. Um, it made its way to the library somehow. And there I found it, luckily. Because today, uh, uh, today, if I to compare when was the last time that the Hebrew Bible of the medieval time was found? This must be go back to the 19th century. So we have a, a this, it is a huge discovery of, of this manuscript. And this is why we believe that it should be the, the glorying crown in the library that we envision in Cairo, because scholars and not scholars, only scholars, visitors could come and see this. Uh, you saw the, the, the pages, the parchments. They are beautiful. They are beautiful in an excellent condition. If you go, for instance, to the Bible Museum in the US and look about what they have there, what we have now in Cairo is 10 times more than what they have there, but we do not have the resources, unfortunately, to establish the library. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was my question, whether anybody has donated the money to build up the, the library, and if so, who, who is it? And now you, you just said that there, there are no sources for it at the moment. Yeah. This is, this is um, uh, Professor Ada, something that is really blowing my head. Uh -huh. I'm, I'm, I'm so frustrated with this that, you know, when I published this article, we got tens of tens of tens of comments. How beautiful, how important, please, what is the corpus? What else you have uh, found in there? And we found a lot. And I, I'm saying, okay, this was just like to, to show you the importance and the value of what we rediscovered. So please, uh, 
help us in a way. There are so many academic institutions, uh, foundations uh, that support this. And all the efforts that we have done till now were we left no, no, I would say positive at, at this time, but uh, we continue to work on this. Uh, we discuss, uh, I, I published this article just like uh, uh, two years ago. So we are still optimistic. We don't have any other option, but to be optimist. <laughs> one, day, one day we will find our sponsor. And- uh, I'm sure. Uh, you no, know, something interesting, Ada. We have, uh, in, uh, we have in Cairo, you can see it here. Uh, this is an old school in the center of the Egyptian capital. Cairo. It, it's a property of the Jewish community. And we want to take this beautiful building and to make it into the library and research, research center. So we have the property, we have the building, we have the space, the land. What we need is to make it as a modern library. Mm, yeah, I understand. So let, let me move to one more, one more uh, participant uh, who wishes to ask questions. Uh, Iwasaki-san, please. Uh, uh, can you hear hi. me? Can you hear yes. me? Okay. Yes, we can hear you. Thank you so much. Hi, um, everybody. Nice to meet you, especially um, Professor Nato. Uh, nice to meet you. My name is Maki Iwasaki, and I'm an associate professor at Matsuyama University and also the research fellow of uh, Sysmore from this year. So I, it was really, uh, thank you for, very much for sharing your precious uh, finding. It was very fascinating to know the Jewish community in Cairo because I've lived in Egypt for three years and this, my background is Libanile in Minya and I've lived in Minya and also Cairo total like three years. So, but I, I just been to um, the Jewish, Jewish synagogue in Cairo only once. That's the only experience. So it was very um, interesting. So my there are kind of three questions. And one, I just want to check that you talked about, I think some population about the Jewish community in Cairo in the, in the beginning, but I couldn't get the numbers. So if you can um, tell us that uh, the popu population of Jewish in Cairo and also, is it ethnically Jewish? And also that religiously, they are all Jewish? Because some Jewish people, they say ethnically like Jewish, but Christians, you know, something like that. So I would like to know the numbers. And my second question is in Egypt, in the modern or current Egyptian, such as like high school, the students have to take the religious classes. So Muslims have to take the Islam class and then Christians take um, Christian class. What about Jewish students? Are there um, class for the Jew Jewish class? And who are the teachers? Are they Jewish or the other religious, religious people teach the Judaism? And my third question is, what's the influence of January 25th revolution to the Jewish people? Because I'm studying about the Coptic Christians in Egypt, and there are so many um, migrations after the January 25th revolution. So what was the, uh, the impact to the Jewish community? So thank you so much. It's my question. Very much questions. Yes. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Mackey. I, um, uh, I, I was, but when we, you just start talking and I saw the background, I thought to myself, this is Japan. It's, uh, it looks to me like very familiar from, <laughs> from Egypt. Uh, so very nice. Uh, very nice seeing this. Um, so as for your first question, uh, in the year 1947, just before the State of Israel uh, was established, in 1947, uh, the number of Jewish, Egyptian Jewish, was uh, slightly more than 80,000 individuals. 80, the manin. Shmonim. Tamanim, Aywa. Tamanim. Tamanim Alf. Aywa, Aywa. Tamanim. 80,000. 42,000. 42,000 
were resided in Cairo. Yani the vast majority, they used to live uh, in Cairo. Um, uh, the other city was Alexandria, Port Said. Um, we have also documents about Jews from Elminia. Oh, that's yes. interesting. Okay. Absolutely. And they used to have a synagogue in Minya and a, a, a cemetery uh, uh, in Minya, like in other communities, a Jewish cemetery and a Jewish synagogue was mm -hmm. in Minya. And we have the name of the chief rabbi. Uh, all, when, the, when in uh, the 1950s and the 1960s, uh, the number of uh, Jewish immigrated from Egypt um, uh, increased, uh, we have letters from the small communities like Minya asking the chief rabbi in Cairo what to do with the uh, Torah scrolls, what to do with, with this, what to do with that. And they used to send them to Cairo to be kept in the other synagogues in the city. Okay. Uh, I didn't mention this, uh, Professor Maki, but I'm... Um, in the last uh, stage of writing a comprehensive book about, uh, about the synagogues and about these uh, findings um, uh, that I took part uh, in. And uh, I will finish this within, I hope so, three or four months. And then I will publish this book in English. And then after that, uh, in Arabic and maybe in Hebrew. So I'm going to also to talk about these small communities in Minya, in Port Said, in uh, the Delta, uh, in Zifta, you know, some very small places, you have two Jews. Oh, and they, they're asking question about kosher and not kosher food and uh, uh, how to, to make uh, praying, things like that. We have a lot of documents about it. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, as for education, your second question, um, when the community was in its, its high time, you know, like the 1930s, 1940s, 1950s, majority of the families used to send their kids to private uh, schools. Most of them, uh, uh, I, I, would not, I would not say most, but many among them were Christian schools. Were Christian schools, like a Frere school in Cairo, um, a French schools uh, also, but the French schools were not uh, belonged to the church. Other schools belonged to the church in Cairo, and they accepted Jewish uh, students. And they used to have um, uh, they used to have an exception for um, a religious class. So if they want, they can participate. But if not, if the family said, uh, "I don't want my my kids to to go to this," uh, then they could they uh, would have other options, uh, playing or doing something else. Not they are not enforcing on them to go into. Um, uh, Christianity class or uh, praying. But we have a lot of evidence about, uh, about uh, uh, some Jews, uh, individuals who converted into Christianity. Uh, and I will write about this in my book that I mentioned, in the book that I mentioned. Uh, in addition, the community used to have several communal schools. They called Hebrew schools. And uh, the level was good, but it was not as good as the foreign schools like the Lycée Francais uh, or some of the uh, uh, schools uh, run by the church. They were the top. In, in, in terms of the level of studying, languages, history, uh, science. Um, I would say that about 40% of the kids uh, are among the Jews 
used to go to the communal schools and 60% to private uh, or foreign schools. And the, the, the bottom line was that you have a very cosmopolitan uh, community. They spoke French, they spoke Arabic, they spoke Hebrew, some of them. Um, yeah. As for uh, the third question, if I understood you correct, was about the 2011 revolution? Yes, right. 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 Uh, you know, this is, this is very interesting. Because if you look into Coptic, um, you will see a trend of uh, immigration from Egypt. But you also see in 2011, a lot of binding between Copts and non-Copts, Egyptian non-Copts, Muslim mainly, uh, who said, uh, we are one hand. Yeah, right. uh, we should work together. Uh, I've been in 2011. Uh, during the uprising in Cairo. And I uh, took a lot of photos about people who raised the, the cross and uh, Islamic uh, emblems. Yes. You see in like in one flag or one hand yeah. and saying the, this is the unity. Um, uh, when the Muslim brothers uh, got to the power uh, and been uh, voted as the biggest uh, party, uh, not few Copts left, immigrated uh, to North America and to other places uh, in the world. Uh, but uh, as you know, uh, Professor Mackey, uh, the brotherhoods, uh, Muslim brotherhood, they were in power just for one year. Yes. <laughs> and they deposed. Right. And obviously after that, um, and I talked about it in my presentation, uh, there is a new kind of a discourse in Egypt in the past, especially in the past five, six years now, about the importance of preserving the minorities. Now, the biggest minority is the Copts, of course. And anyone who would like to address the political level and the social level in Egypt should look into question about minorities. First among them, the Coptic, the Copts. And uh, uh, one example, Professor Mackey. Uh, you recall, I guess, that the Egyptians are building now a new Egyptian capital, administrative capital, not in Cairo. It's like 60 kilometers almost from Cairo. They're building a new city, a huge one. And all the administration will move there. And Cairo will become like uh, the historic uh, center. It will still be the capital and the, the, the symbol of, of the country. But they built a new Egyptian administrative capital. One of the first building is a huge Coptic church. Huge Coptic church. And the president, Abdel Fattah Sisi, inaugurated the, this uh, building. And he talked a lot about the importance that he is giving to protect the Copt as Egyptians, not as a minority. He said, these are Egyptians like us. We are Muslim, we are the majority, but these are Egyptians of another religion sect. Now, in Egypt, unlike in maybe Israel or Japan, you know, the president, uh, sorry, the prime minister can, can, can say whatever he wants. And we, uh, Israelis or you Japanese, you have the freedom to take or not to take and you know, he's just a prime minister. He's now in office. Within short span of time, someone else will replace him, right? This is the politics of uh, democracy. In Egypt, President Abdel Fattah Sisi words talking about the Copts or about minorities or mentioning the Jewish heritage 
This has a lot of significance because it comes from the top of the pyramid down into the bureaucracy, into the regime, and then to the society levels. So yes, I think it is important that the president is shedding light, more light on the question of minority, Copts first and foremost, but also Jewish. Thank I you think very I answered much. your questions. Yeah, very much. I understand very well. Thank you so much, Professor Metal. Thank My you, pleasure. Professor Thank Adam. you. Thank you for the questions and the and the answer. And we have one more uh, person, uh, Sida Sensei, who wish to ask yes. a question. Uh, please. Okay. Uh, thank you for your wonderful lecture. Uh, I have one question about your uh, 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 about the contribution of your discovery to the uh, Masoretic studies in the middle, uh, medieval Masoretic studies. Uh, according to your explanation, you you have shown uh, some similarities between the. Uh, 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 in this uh, manuscript, current manuscript and uh, uh, mm -hmm. Leningrad Codex, and so uh, it is. Is it proper to assume uh, uh, there is a, uh, the Masoretic <laughs> uh, in the Masoretic cultures in in the Middle Ages uh, in Egypt, uh, the, the kind of uh, collaboration between the uh, Rabbani school and <laughs> the Karite school, or mm -hmm. uh, is it proper to assume? Uh, uh, the kind of controversy be between uh, the two schools and the current uh, groups create could create uh, some own traditional uh, or see their own masoretic tradition. So I am wondering about uh, the the situation of the uh, scribing uh, um, between the two groups, Arabic groups and the Karabit groups in the middle, uh, medieval Egypt. So what, what do you think about the uh, uh, contribution uh, of your uh, discovery, the great discovery uh, to, the, to the Masoretic studies? This is my question. Okay, thank you, um, uh, Mr. Shibat, for, for this question. It's, uh, it's very complex to answer, yes, yes. frankly. <laughs> yeah. uh, but I will try to take you mm -hmm. um, into it. Uh, first, we should distinguish between different uh, periods mm -hmm. in time. Okay. Um, in the early medieval times, mm -hmm. in the early medieval times, mm -hmm. someone, for instance, you are, you know, like you have a lot of uh, resources, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. you commission the scribe to produce for you uh, a copy of the Bible. You commission someone. Mm -hmm. This work will take, uh, uh, we assume, something like uh, uh, two years mm -hmm. in average, mm -hmm. two years. So you have to pay for mm -hmm. a lot of money because mm -hmm. someone should take the, the letter mm -hmm. and process the letter. Mm -hmm. Another one will have the lines, you know, just to have lines. Another one will come and write the text, just copy mm -hmm. the Bible. Mm -hmm. Another one will come and make the illustrations, like mm -hmm. this okay. beautiful <laughs> illustrations. Yes. Another one will make the punctuation, mm -hmm. you know, the vowels. Mm -hmm. and, and you see, mm -hmm. yes. it's a lot mm -hmm. of people and work. Ah. It takes time and a lot mm -hmm. of resources. Okay. Now, okay. we do not know, for instance, Mm. Uh, for sure, mm. uh, a lot about the biography mm -hmm. of the writers. Mm. We know mm. nothing about mm. uh, the one who produced the illustrations, mm. the artisans. Mm. We know nothing about the one who processed the, the letter. Mm. You see, we know nothing about them. Yeah, yes. We don't have this information. This is why my uh, the manuscript that I found is so important because this is in first person. Mm. He said, "My mm. name is Zakaria." <laughs> no, this is for the yes, so important. Yes. My name is Zakaria. Yeah, mm. Please don't forget mm. me. Mm. I'm uh, I'm I'm I am the person 
uh, who has done this uh, mm. uh, text, you can see it here. I am Zachariah the scribe. And I wrote this and, and mm. here, he said, I finished this in the eighth day of the month of Tammuz in the year. <laughs> this mm -hmm. You see, yes. we don't have this information in other. Uh, so yes. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. Now, mm. I am not an expert mm -hmm. on Masoretic studies. Mm -hmm. my, yes. my hope mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. that people who are interested in this mm -hmm. will go and read my article mm -hmm. that was published in the Jewish mm -hmm. Quarterly, mm -hmm. read it, mm -hmm. and because this is much more informative than what I presented uh -huh. here, mm -hmm. you see, here I, we have a time limit, uh, yes. so I presented in brief mm -hmm. some of the content, but I, uh, I, I hope uh, that scholars who are interested or students interested in, in the Masoretic mm -hmm. will read the text, uh -huh. Mm -hmm. and see what they can do with it, because I'm not an expert on Masoretic mm -hmm. uh, studies. Um, the, la the last point I would like to make is about interpretation. Now, because we do not know much about the scribes mm -hmm. themselves, mm -hmm. scholars in our time use other materials and sources mm -hmm. trying to build like a puzzle. You know, I like to complete yes, the yes, puzzle. Yes. Mm -hmm. Take piece from here, piece from there, mm. the Geniza, mm. uh, letters, someone. So for mm. instance, mm. I studied very carefully the Geniza mm. fragments to find, it took me two months to find who is this Zachariah the scribe? <laughs> <laughs> so I found one manuscript in Cambridge uh, University. <laughs> mm. collection. I found one, man, one manuscript mm -hmm. about his daughter. Mm -hmm. His daughter has an issue in the court, in the rabbinic mm -hmm. court. Okay. And the rabbinic court used to take notes about who's uh, complaining about something. Oh, yes. And yes. they said, uh, today we have uh, Mrs. Mm. Her name. Yes, yes, she yes. is the daughter of Zechariah the scribe. Wow, <laughs> it's wonderful. And, and, the same year, and the year is the same year. Uh, so I was uh, happy. I said, oh, I worked two months to find this uh, about Zakaria. Uh, so it's a, it's a painstaking work. Uh, it takes a lot of efforts. I spent one year about writing yes. this article. Mm. Because first I have to, to study how to study manuscript. For me, it was unfamiliar land, mm -hmm. how to study a manuscript. Mm -hmm. I had to read, I, you know, I had to read tens of books, mm -hmm. hundreds of, mm -hmm. I took a sabbatical yes, yes. year. Mm -hmm. I took mm -hmm. a sabbatical year just for this purpose. Mm -hmm. but, uh, I'm, I think I, I'm satisfied with this um, and it will stay for, you know, for, for good now. It's out there, yes. it's out there. Mm -hmm. No one will dare to touch this because people know that we have the manuscript. So no one will, will do anything wrong here because this is today one of the rarest mm -hmm. biblical Hebrew biblical manuscript in the world. Mm -hmm. yes. it's Listen, the we, think, we, think it's we the talk first. about almost 600 parchments. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Yes. See, so, uh, I, yes. want just, I want to take you just to... Mm -hmm. um, to look into, mm -hmm. into this. You see the thick of this manuscript here? And yeah. you can see mm -hmm. that this was reported by the New York mm -hmm. Times mm -hmm. on February 23rd, 2020. Mm -hmm. Their journalist learned about my article from someone and they published a story mm -hmm. about the rediscovery. Not every time that for me, I'm writing an academic article. Someone is going to write about it in the New York Times, mm -hmm. right? So maybe now that uh, maybe more people in Japan will know about this uh, 
Yes, I have read. Yes, I have read your article. I have read your paper, uh, but I am not. I'm, unfortunately, I have not. I'm not uh, the Masoretic study <laughs> scholar. But not only for Masoretic. Anyway, but the study me. is so Even interesting. Me, not yes, me. thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. We, we, I have to stop here. We have to uh, to finish our lecture. Uh, I'm really sorry because we would like very much to to talk more. Um, but uh, I would like to to bring it into a closure, and uh, I wish to thank you very very much, Professor Metal, for giving us a beautiful, marvelous uh, uh, lecture about that specific text, and uh, we hope to maybe be able to uh, make our students. Uh, uh, curious about it and maybe go on and study it because some of our students may maybe will be interested in that we have to think about it and uh, I really wish to uh, close here, thank you very much, thank you.